photography. I think we were on the 44th slide. Yeah, we were. Oh, this is the fun part. I think we have two hours. If I blaze through it, okay. So we have a choice. We either do a few exercises and proofs, or I blaze through it, or sorry, I, I skip the the pedagogy part, or like sorry, I skip the the exercise part, and I can probably get to elliptic curves if I go really fast. So I think you guys are very interested in elliptic curves. So I have other examples written out, especially for digital signatures, more of the little Bitcoin stuff, like so the little ball cane. Now we're signing it, but I'm gonna skip that. Because we don't, if, if we want to get to the juicy elliptic curves, at least the theory, then we, don't have we do not have time. And uh, you know what? I'm going to pull out. Uh, signatures not based off of elliptic curves? Sorry? No, it, it, just because, um, what's it called? I, I haven't added the, the ones in Bouncy Castle on these yet. So I was using SHA, like SHA-224 with, you know, yeah, I was using SHA-224 with ECDSA, but I wasn't using like the Edwards curves, the twisted oh, Edwards curves, okay, the Wait, cool ones. The... No, do you think we have time? Barely. <laughs> I wish I, I had time for bilinear pairings and Edwards curves. But okay, but uh, hold on. Edwards curves requires some algebraic topology background to understand why they're efficient. So even if I had time for lattices, I, we would not have time for Edwards curves because they require a background that like not even I have too well. I have it to some degree because I have to write a thesis on it. But, but yeah, is it time? You throw Should should we? Do an on I, I uh, if I if I don't sleep in, I am so tired. Well, no, right now I'm not tired. I have that adrenaline. Then you know, once the talk is officially done, I'm gonna just collapse on the floor immediately. Yeah, I, I get that. It's all that excitement. It's all that adrenaline. I'm going to pay for this the years down the line with a heart attack. But uh, I'll wait for a few more people. So I'll, I'll go until, uh, let's go to 340. 340 we start. So feel free to. We some of the math exercises on the board. We just mess around with them all the time. I mean, like the thing is that the math exercises are on the, essentially, so the ones I have here. Um, that I wrote, or I could just—I mean, I could just go to the textbook and tab out. But um, so one I have on the factorization for so one is on on specifically the difference of squares. Um, then I have Pollard's p minus one factorization methods is another one on integer factorization. These are the ones that I wanted to cover because essentially they are why RSA is really really vulnerable in very specific ways and why people are moving away from RSA into the glorious land of elliptic curves. <laughs> However, um, it looked like this. Bunch of numbers down the line. And I have to explain everything, including why the, this, these are the, the cliff notes. Then I would have to write and state this problem and then give the proof, do the GCD by hand, so on and so forth. It takes time. Um, so what I would like to do is that maybe next year I'll submit another abstract for those that are equipped with this knowledge a year from now, and I will cover the advanced topics in cryptography. So I will literally start at elliptic curves, and we'll go from there. And we will cover zero knowledge proofs. We will cover per, like perfect core secrecy. We'll cover a bunch of really, really cool things in cryptography um, that I would also, sorry? Yeah, everything you can think of, even the post-quantum crypto. I'm not sure about those. I don't know those very well. But the things that I do know, well, well, I mean, maybe a year from now I will. So, you know. Wait, we are not here. Are we? Uh, we were yeah, we, we, were, we were at the, the, the yeah. from S Little Theorem. We oh, we did. Cool. So, 340. Yeah, this is the generator. Cleo. Mm -hmm. cool. Question for, for people, I guess, that, that work in space. Is the post-quantum crypto you know, issues, is that becoming a practical concern? Or Not anytime it's, soon. Both the attack, the, like the worry about quantum is, it's not imminent, 
but there's also solutions that are have been proposed that are also not ready for prime time. Yeah. But like I think by the time that quantum becomes a real threat, we will have the real solution. I'm not sure. I mean, it's very hard to say if we will even see a quantum computer in a lifetime. It could be. It could be one of those things that some guy figures out randomly and we have a boom. Then it might matter a lot more immediately because in theory, quantum cryptography is essentially because a lot of these algorithms that are essentially, what's it called? Exponential, sub-exponential time on our regular like sequential computers become essentially polynomial time in quantum computers. So we want that, we want to stick with that hardness in the quantum realm. That's why we made these things. And because, you know, the moment that, you know, quantum computing came up, somebody went like, oh, holy moly, this breaks everything we're doing. So, um, I don't follow it, but I mean, you hear the news like, I've got X number of qubits, machines, or. It's like not even. It's usually do something. I it's usually know. like two. It's about a 15,000 qubit machine to break a standard, like, uh, elliptic curve key. Okay. Um, like, I do know if this is a bit elliptic curve key. I think we've gotten stable quantum computers at like eight qubits. I, I think it's less. I don't remember, but not stable. They're like they're unstable quantum. They're they're stable for the experiment. The problem set has to be constrained to things that are like more noise tolerant than like a typical CPU. Yeah, and also that their methods of you know measuring has always has to do with what's it called entanglement, and it's all complicated. There could be. There could be, but we don't know yet. I mean, we we don't have anything practical to say. Yeah. We don't. Um, but actually, there's someone who's there's a, Q, talk on there's a Q sharp, sharp talk. Yeah. But that's still like higher level than like the, you know, just, the yeah. qubits it's themselves. Not even, yeah, exactly. There's like but a. The, either way, there are quantum resistant cryptography algorithms that have been proposed yeah. that are being vetted kind of as we speak. But those are not based on the same problems of number theory. They tend to be essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, 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 they're more in, in between the abstract algebra and algebraic topology realm, where a lot of it has to do with, what's it called, like, specific ways of route traversals and how, how you traverse, like, lattices. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting field. Um, I don't know it. And are those just, like, Sorry? you know, the, the term you always hear for P equals, not equals MP, certain classes of problems being one that are good for um, encryption, so I, I didn't talk about it too much because it, it was, I guess, I'm trying to really blaze through it. But essentially, all of cryptography is like, you can preface it with, you know, cryptography is cool if it exists. Because a lot of the stuff that we are dealing with has to do with one-way functions, especially with this. So like, essentially, the, what, we're, what we are trying to prove in asymmetric cryptography in general tends to be something like... Um, this problem is hard for us to verify, but hard to invert. It's hard. It's, it's essentially hard if you don't have the right information, right? So that has the, the it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-way function. It's also called a trapdoor function. Trapdoor function is a little bit of a more weaker notion, but it's the same thing. The, the, sometimes, like, people use them analogously, depending yeah, on. More importantly, things like the D-log problem, which is what Diffie Hellman and the curves are based off of, are assumed to be hard, but not provably hard. Well, here's the, in general, any trapdoor function, the main issue is the P, the PNP problem tells us that, you know, if P equals MP, then all problems, what is it, all problems that you can essentially um, verify in, in polynomial time, you can solve in polynomial time, if it's equal, right? So that's the thing. Um, cryptography, you are working with polynomial time. So that means that if, P is equal to NP, then trapdoor functions don't exist. That means all of our hash functions are verifiable in polynomial time. Um, it could be, okay, so there is a, an, an even weaker notion. It could be that the polynomial has such large constants that it's, the, like I've seen little edge cases where, you know, it, it can happen that the verification polynomial is, has very, very large constants that make it impractical. But in general, it would break a lot of, like the, just the theoretical implication would break the notion of cryptography. But at um, the same time, like the big industry around P equals MP, still like we're, we're pretty it, sure that it doesn't. It, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Prove it yet. Exactly. So so yeah. So like I think a poll had something like ninety percent of computer scientists going P is not equal MP. It was a very high number, because um, a lot of things they you know point towards that. But there's the people that are 
skeptical for the sake of, you know, like don't just give, don't just assume and then waste all research on trying to prove only P is not equal to MP. Like, so you can try to prove the converse. Maybe you can get a, what's it called? A contrapositive proof. Who knows? Um, wow, it is 345. We should start now. Okay, so primitive root theorem, generators, we covered that. Let's move on. So this is the only part where I'm actually going to talk about history because this part is kind of cool because it's recent, actually. I mean, 1976 is not that, it's definitely older than me and a lot of us here, but it's um, not like the majority of mathematics where everything was made 200 plus years ago, even in the time of the Greeks. Um, in 19, what's it called, 1976, um, Diffie and Hellman posted it's like some paper called New Directions in Cryptography, where they defined essentially like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And this is the part where I talk about one-way functions that, you know, if, if they exist, like, you know, if they exist, if they don't exist, what the implications are. Um, but essentially, this, this, kind of this paper, this is kind of what, what kick-started like public key crypto in general. Like this paper is like the seminal paper on public key crypto um, for starters. It was like the first one that, that had a public key. It wasn't even a public key crypto system. It was a public key like scheme because it's key exchange. You cannot encrypt anything with it. But, you know, um, like I said, for the, before I officially started again, when we functions are only theoretical. So it could be that with a you know, probability that all of everything that I'm talking about is BS because it doesn't exist. But all right, let's enter the discrete logarithm problem. And it's a really simple problem. It's simply applying the, so for a group, applying the, the function, the binary operator, n times. Um, so basically, figuring out this x. So if you don't know this x, and you know h, right? And you, you know g, you know h, figure out what x is. And essentially, for a finite field fp, so basically a final field in the, in the integers, the primes, it translates to g to the power of x is h mod p. And this is, and you are solving for x. You know g and you know h and you know p. And it turns out that this problem tends to be a little bit harder than it seems. It seems, you know, off, off the top of your head, it just seems like really simple. But for example, this is the distribution for 6, 27 to the i mod uh, 691. So for getting a particular number, you see that this is actually looks almost random. This distribution is almost random, not really random. It's pseudo, it's basically pseudo random, um, not perfectly, not uniform. But I just want to get into the fact that this ends up being one of the like first definitions of what the one-way function would, you would you would want it to be. Um, and it turns out that that's a little bit harder than it might seem. So now let's go well, like this part. I'm kind of fast forwarding um, because there's a bunch of stuff to to cover. But now we're going to talk about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And remember, the undertone here is that the DLP is hard. We, we can talk about essentially how hard it is soon. But first, let's talk about the DLP. And this is where everything comes together. Um, I talked about generators, and we talked about finite fields. So for the DLP, we have a trusted source. So we, we're going to work under the, under the assumption that we have a trusted source, like a bulletin board set in stone, you know, that publishes a large prime p and a generator g, right? So it's essentially you're, you're, you're publishing g, which is in fp, p, right? And now these are publicly known parameters. And now Alice and Bob, actually, if you, want, you guys want to know a funny thing, I, I had it under... Uh, under digital signatures, which we're not, we're not going to do practically because we're not, not going to have time. I had it as Jose and Jose B, but uh, <laughs> Alice and Bob, it's okay, you can laugh. I can laugh at myself. That, I heard that since I was in like kindergarten. Um, so let's say Jose wants to c communicate with Jose B. So what Jose does is knowing G and knowing P, he computes essentially g to some power. Now, he, he keeps a, you know, a is in fp, so it's an element. Um, it's, it's not going to be p minus 1. Um, so remember, we, we want it to be less than this, because the Fermat's little theorem tells us that this gives us 1. So 
we want it to be we want it to make it a little bit hard um, but anyway so we have ENFP and Jose is gonna compute G to the a mod P this is what Jose publishes right and this is what this is essentially ignoring a man in the middle attack um, this is let's say this is public known now Jose B has a, so we're calling, we're calling this, by the way, this is not public and known, this A is secret. This is a privately, this is, a, this is private. You know, we usually call this a private exponent. And if you see the, if you see the slides, I'm, I'm going through it, but this is, I'm going for it from the top to bottom, essentially. So now host B is doing, has essentially a secret exponent B in the range of, you know, one to P minus two. Um, so we have, and then he computes G to the B mod to P. And then they talk to each other. Jose sends Jose B this. Jose B sends Jose this. What happens is that, let's call this A. And let's call this B. Right, so what Essentially, <clears throat> what Jose computes is that he computes B to the power of A mod P. And Jose B computes A, sorry, yeah, that's an A, not a B. I did it right. Um, A to the power of B mod P. And it turns out that these are equivalent, actually. So this actually gives you G to the A B mod P. This also gives you g to the ab mod p. Why are they distributed? Because I mean, because of essentially the properties of multiplication, um, over modular arithmetic, especially. Like if you were to multiply, like th this, this, this law holds. Like for example, if you m two times m two m squared like mod p, it's the same thing as saying m to the four mod p. And this holds. And now they have a key. So now they have a shared key. They establish a shared key. And we have, you know, evil guy here, Darth or whatever, in the middle. And unless he can solve the discrete logarithm problem, either for A or for B, he cannot extract the, their shared key. So knowing, I mean, having, G, so assuming that, you know, this, this Darth, Darth, he cannot, you know, play, he cannot do a man in the middle attack, of course. Um, then he needs to solve the discrete logarithm problem to be able to solve this. He needs to solve either, I mean, he could solve g to the a b, but he could solve g to the a. But like this, this, by the way, this quantity is privately calculated, so this is not published. This is their shared secret key, but he needs to solve g to the a mod p is equal to some x, because remember this is publicly known. This is, let's call this or g to the b mod p. He needs to solve equations of this form. And to be clear, you can't combine the g to the b and the g to the a to get g to the a b because there's the extra g. What do you mean? You cannot combine? What do you mean? As in the two things that were passed over the wire are g to the a and g to the b. Mm -hmm. And you can't use those two values. No, no, no. It's not. It, it will be a... It would be a different result, exactly. yes. Or is it, you can't tease. Because I mean, because yeah. because it holds. I mean, it holds the same way. If you if you were to do that, then you would have g to the a plus b. You would not have g to the a b. Mm -hmm. This is just because essentially the, the the same laws of exponentiation hold for modular arithmetic. And actually, modular arithmetic is really really easy to calculate very very high powers. Um, as I will show you guys soon, something called the fast powering algorithm. Um, which is super super simple to compute. Okay, so shared value is g to the a b, right? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. All right. And this is secret. So. A, B is secret? Yes. So. Jose B computed this and did not tell it to the world. Jose computed this, and did not tell it to the world, and they will use that, let's say, as their symmetric encryption key. It's like they both know g to the a b. They don't know both x Correct. Exactly. So he does not know b, and he does not know a. But due to the nice laws of essentially modular arithmetic, this holds. 
and this is nice because this also means that you know like th this holds essentially because of the laws i mean i don't have any other way of putting it um so i guess we can talk about a little bit we can talk about hardness now how hard is it to do the you know the street logarithm problem and it turns out i mean first thing you could do is just brute force that would take a long time it's not even linear i mean because you have to find exponents that give you this and it's not necessarily um you can't just take the modulo of the exponent because it won't necessarily work that way um i'm going to go very pseudo mathematical here um but essentially this is secure as hard as the dlp is but the dlp does have algorithms that attack it in essentially logarithmic time so there's a there's an algorithm called Shanks baby step giant step. Um, again, sorry if I blaze through this. What time is it already? Three fifty six. Yeah, we need to we need to book it. Um, so essentially, there are algorithms that compute it in oh, what's it called? N log n. And by the way, so one thing I I didn't I'll explain what this n is. But one thing I didn't I didn't um, one thing I didn't um, talk about was group order. I, I skipped over it because essentially we, we, we don't talk about it until in very, very soon in RSA, but we didn't talk about it at first. But it's a very simple concept, the order of an element. So the order of a group, so let's say a group or a finite field, the order, because we're talking about finite fields, but it's the same thing. The order of the finite field here, oh, holy moly, order is the number of unit elements. Unit elements are elements that have an inverse. Um, and usually we call that Euler's well, torsion function. Call it phi of n, which is essentially number of units. And for a finite field, that's always going to be p minus 1. We know that already. So we don't have to, And by the way, this is not counting 0. That's why it's p minus 1. Um, but uh, so yeah, the number of units is always going to be phi n. Um, and it's not kind of zero because I mean, if you if you were on two different fields, it would count zero twice. So there's that. Um, anyway, um, so that's the that's the or that might be wrong. Sorry, let me retract that. But anyway, regardless, this is the order of a group, and the order of an element in a group. So here's the thing: the order of a group has a really interesting property that, um, for group theory, a to the power of phi n. Um, What's it called? You know what? I'm, 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 I'm going to speak in a group, so no mod. Um, a to the power of phi n for a finite field, so it, for something that has an inverse, is the same thing as we defined back here, Fermat's little theorem. Where are is it? So you see that p minus 1 is actually phi n for a group, right? So this is actually going to give you the empty element. Um, so Fermat's little theorem is actually defined in terms of groups as well. But um, so the order of an element, though, so a to the phi n is always going to be the empty element. But there's some elements in FP that have essentially uh, that reach that empty element before phi n. So they don't. So not every element. So like you know, this this does hold. So this is a law that holds for every single element, right? But there there can be some b that is less, you know, such that b is less than phi of n less than phi of n so b is less than phi of n and it happens that you know this you know this this um this thing is not equal but an interesting part is that b actually divides phi of n so that this is a little interesting property that we, will come in handy soon um but uh, essentially, what I was getting to is that Shanks baby step giant step works in this format. So this n is actually the so in they, they in, in textbooks they put it like this, but this n is actually the order. So remember, we are talking about the DLP. So we're talking about g to the x mod p is equal to h, or the other way around, g to the x is equal to h mod p. It's actually the latter one. Ignore the former. This one. So we're, we're concerned with this congruence, and n 
in particular is defined as just the, the order of the particular element. Um, and you end up computing this in logarithmic time. And then there's an algorithm called Paul Gilman, which takes on, uh, again, this is, I, I can make examples, but, and which, like, have some jotted down, but no time. Um, so you're going to have to take my word for it that essentially Pollock Hellman can use something called the Chinese remainder theorem to take a function that can solve the DLP in logarithmic time and turn it into linear time. Um, so that's interesting. Not necessarily. I mean, it, it can happen that, that like, it can be large. Like, a, for example, we were talking about sometimes, like, 2,000 digit primes. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the order of, a, of the generator element. But it's, it, it is, I mean, it isn't as hard. I mean, that's partially why people do with ECDLP, because essentially, like, um, when we get to elliptic curves, but security for stuff like RSA and Diffie-Hellman requires large primes, mm -hmm. because we have these functions that know how to beat this. So the only way to, you know, mitigate it properly is to make the constant factor so large that it's very infeasible to do it. Um, so now let's talk about RSA and integer factorization. So we saw the DLP. That's one construction. And by the way, the DLP has something called Elgamal. Um, Elgamal is uh, actually a public key crypto system that uses the DLP, similar to RSA, but nobody uses Elgamal, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but if you're interested, there's the books. I, they are on one of the first slides, and I would really recommend you see it because it's really interesting. What happens with Elgamal is that you basically just play with nonces, and you, play with, you, you use a nonce, and then you play with modular arithmetic in such a way that um, raising your, your m to some power can like scramble your message, and then having an inversion function unscrambles it. Um, do you guys want me to go through it? I would have to look at the, the little thing, but I can explain it really well. No, let's just move on. OK, so let's move to RSA. Um, so first, before we actually talk about RSA, we have to talk about what RSA is, what the difficulty is based off of, because it's not the DLP. It's a different problem. Where the, the, the problem is mainly integer factorization. But first, let's talk about U Euler's formula for P and Q. It's actually the theorem. So if P and Q are distinct primes, and we, let, we set G to the, G, like, to the greatest common denominator of basically P minus 1 and Q minus 1, then A P minus 1 Q minus 1 over G is 1 mod PQ. And this is provable. I, I will prove this one really quickly. So um, we already talked about essentially how, how like the order of an element What's it called? How is not, doesn't necessarily have to be p minus one, but in so in this case, this transitively applies. But now imagine that we were not working under p q like p minus one and q minus one. Let's just work under p and q. So we have a to the p minus one. Q, let's just consider this minus one over g, right? So the g is a GCD of what's it called of uh, p minus one and q minus one, right? Let's have this mod p, and we're going to do this mod q. p minus 1, q minus 1, over g, mod q. So here's the interesting portion. So for p, this one's really simple. Let's just move around brackets. p minus 1 to the power of q minus 1. Is anybody getting a, uh, sorry, over G? We can actually call this an integer Q. It doesn't matter. Or let's say Q prime. It's just, it's just an integer. We know, we know because this is the greatest common divisor. So this clearly divides Q. It's defined. It's the greatest common divisor. So it divides both of them. Um, but now, is anybody getting for mass little theorem vibes here? One. Yeah, exactly. This is one. And one more P. And this applies here as well. And then you can extend this proof to work over mod PQ, um, which is not very complicated. But essentially, that is one of the first things that we want to consider. Then the next thing we want to consider is that this actually applies as well to, now let's have P and Q be distinct primes. 
and have that instead of the GCD of p minus one and q minus one to each other, let's have some e, some e element, um, and we need an e such that that is relatively prime to that product. Um, so we, and we do know that that has an inverse modulo. Um, thus, d e exists. We know we know this exists. Then we have a different congruence now. We have x to the e, so let, let, let's, let's move this problem a little bit. We have x to the e to the power of c mod pq, right? We can say that this has a solution, x is equal to c to the d. This might be a little bit hard to see at first. So, yeah, it is a field. Um, but it, it, it's essentially a little bit, a, a little bit more, uh, it's, it's very, how can I say it? Yeah, so no, hold on. It's not a field. Hold on. PQ is not necessarily a field. Because P is a field and Q is a field. Hold on. PQ is not necessarily a field. When you multiply two primes, you don't get a prime back. So, I mean, if you did, then you, it, it wouldn't be a, you know, would you, you, you would be a prime. It would still be a field. It would be a prime field. No, because the only way you can have an integer field is to have a prime, a modulo or prime. Because otherwise, a, the prime itself violates that. Right, because the prime is going to divide that. So p, so p and q includes p and q in the, what's it called, in the domain. So it doesn't work, but it works for, th this, this applies here, actually. Um, so without going into the proof, this is actually what RSA is, like the hardness of that problem is what RSA is based off of. So RSA as a crypto system is based off of the assumption that, well, and it's a really wrong assumption, by the way, but that x to the e is congruent to c mod p. But now our quantities known are different. We know this, we know this, and we know this, but we do not know x. The hard part is that we do not know x, but we have a very easily invertible solution, which is x is e, what's it called? x equal to, what? yeah, c to the d. Um, so actually, it, like the, the proof of that, you know, I think, I think it might help you guys. Um, if you were to move that there, so let's have x uh, to the e mod pq. We can actually change that to c to the d, what's it called? E d mod pq. Now, if, if what I told you before convinces you, the fact that these two, so d and e mod essentially p minus 1 and q minus 1, they will actually essentially give you, um, what's it called? Or sorry, uh, x is equal to c to the d. Sorry, I did it a little bit uh, wrong, I think. So x is equal to, sorry. So. mod is equal to c mod they call it pq so actually so so like the, the reason i did it wrong is because it's the the actual substitution is on the wrong side so if i were to change this x to the e as as you know c to the d then to move it to the other side i would essentially have to have essentially the, the identity. So let's move it here. C to the D. Like essentially we, we, want, we want to prove that this is a solution. So we end up with something like this. If this gives you the identity, so if you were, if you were, to, if you were able to raise X to the E, what's it called? To, to the, what's it called? CD. Um, then you would have, you could essentially cancel this out. And you can recover the ciphertext. I'm, I'm, I'm half passing the proof because it is 410. We're done at 5, and I want to get to elliptic curves. I'm sorry for half passing the proof. Sorry? Sorry? 530, but I still have quite a lot. So I'm, I'm really sorry for like sometimes half passing these proofs. But like I, I would really love to get to 
to elliptic curves and why they're cool. Um, and they are after integer factorization. And I do want to essentially do at least maybe one example of integer factorization, which is pretty cool. Um, or I might just show it to you from a textbook. Um, but so this is, this is essentially how RSA works, where you can essentially, you under the, the guise of this problem, now you pick some primes p and q, and we call this n. And then we compute, sometimes people call it r, which is p minus 1. And I'm sorry if the, I think that the proofs are very unsatisfactory. I think I can tell, but it's time constraints are our devil right now. So r is p minus 1, q minus 1. And essentially, we want to compute, we, we want to pick an e such that, you know, it has an inverse in p minus 1, q minus 1. So we want e d is equal to 1 you know, mod r, right? And RSA is simply this. If you want to encrypt a message with a private key. So uh, by the way, and the pi I want to I get into what it is. So n e is your public key. So n d is your private key. So this, the fact that essentially this knowledge is a difficult part, right? Uh, finding this and how you would even find this is because you need R in the first place. You, you are given E, right? So the hard part is factorizing this prime. So if you could factorize N, you could break RSA. So simply we have, for example, let's say X to the E mod N. This is how you would encrypt and then decrypt. We would take x to the e d, sorry, let's call this c. We would have c to the d to the e is equal to x, so not equal to congruent mod n. I'm playing around with this modular arithmetic. Um, sorry if it's a little bit boring, but this essentially is how RSA works. This would essentially, that's a lot, you get x, you can recover x this way. And thus, sorry, oh, heading up. Um, and this is RSA. There's our RSA in a nutshell. And this is what, what it shows there. So, you know, we have the, the what's it called, the private key. Um, we like, we compute D and then, you know, M, M prime is equal to plain text, C to the D mod N. So the strength of RSA is clearly due to integer factorization. Yes? Uh, so why is it called A Because this is not equal to this. They're different. Your E and your D parameters are not the same. So the main thing about it, like asymmetry is that now I can publish my public key and I keep the private key to myself. Okay, got it, got it. And what happens is that anybody, sorry, I probably should have covered that, but um, anybody that, so if I can publish my public key over a secure channel, anybody that has my public key can send me messages in such a way that nobody else can decrypt them but me, assuming that, you know, RSA is secure, which is not. But we'll get to why soon, very soon. Um, so essentially, how would we break RSA? As, aside from solving this problem, you know, the main, the main issue here isn't exactly just the, the C to the D calculation, specifically. The problem is N. Because we saw the fundamental, th the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So we know that any number can be broken up into a unique prime factorization. So there is a unique prime factorization for n, which is pq. So if we had n, if we could solve, what's it called? If we could solve for p or q, then you would get the other one, because obviously you just divided the n. And you would be able to then invert e, because you would have p minus 1, q minus 1, and you broke RSA. Um, thus, integer factorization actually became, like, grew as a field purely because of RSA. Well, not purely, but partially because of RSA. Um, because at the time, the, the, the cool thing was, like, how do we break the scheme? Um, and it actually turns out that 
it's not as secure as it might seem. Like this might, it might seem like this is, this is a hard problem. But uh, yeah, so there's, there's the sibs, there's the index calculus, there is essentially, there's the um, Pollard's P minus one. Um, then there's one that has to do with um, difference of squares. Um, wait, I call this index calculus. This is actually difference of squares. My bad. This is, this is wrongly titled. Um, index calculus is an important one, but it's not for this. Index calculus is for the di discrete logarithm problem. I will change, like I will repost the slides and I will change that. But this is not this. This is titled wrong. So index so index calculus breaks DLP. Um, this is factorization via difference of squares, and this breaks integer factorization. This is trying to factor integers in a very interesting way. So the right the really interesting thing is that this equation. I'm pretty sure you've all seen it since the grade school. You know x squared minus y squared is x minus y, x plus y. Really simple equation. But it turns out that um, you can actually break RSA via essentially having two primes being really close together and building, so th there's essentially three steps. So you build a bunch of relations. So you, you try to find essentially, you, you, you're build, you call relation building. So we're, we're trying to find a bunch of things that conform to this shape. Not exactly that shape, by the way, that, not that, like in, in a very modified way. But we're trying to solve uh, exactly for, for example, some number, you know, C1 squared is equal to, for example, um, M mod some N, right? So let's call it C1. So let's say this number right here. So let's say if we actually square this number, so let's see if C1 squared, we would hope, let's, let's say this is H, we actually hope that H itself is a product of primes. And these are to alter some power, but that this is itself is a square. And then you actually just do a really, really kind of simple transformation. So you have, you essentially take First, the result of C1. So you, by the way, this is relation building, so this is not the only one. You get, more, you get multiple of these. So you try to find multiple, essentially, um, numbers within your finite field that conform to this, you know, to this shape. Um, and then you do. You just have to get pretty lucky for it to be a case that. Well, you see, it happens. So that's the thing. You actually don't have to be that lucky when x and y are close together. So if you have very close together primes, you don't have to be that lucky. Um, so because when you essentially try for like certain ar like certain numbers arbitrarily, um, you will eventually hit it. So you you might try like two squared to two cubed to you know to do something, and then you eventually hit it. And it's actually not not that not that like nuts to do it that way. But um, I mean I can show you a better graph. I did not include it here. Um, but a better graph comes from this book right here. So if I were to go into, sorry, wrong one. If I were to go into integer, so I'm talking about factorization via the difference of squares. So, sorry. So you see you try like some number plus one squared is equal to something. You try this and then you double check whether it's a square. So remember, we're, we're, we want C1 to be a square. Right, and you see, this is this is not that crazy. You just you you have a number, you have a, like a relation build, and, and then you try to add. You add it in such a way that it, it gives you a square, and then once it gives you a square, I'll go back to my slides, huh? Uh, then you get multiple of these squares. You compute you compute their sum. So C one squared plus C two squared plus C three squared is equal to, and now this is going to be some, some part of the small primes, P, not yeah, P, Q, S, blah, squared, mod, P. And then if I recall correctly, then all you have to do is essentially take, yeah. So all you have to do is if you can essentially find this relation, you also have to compute C1, C2, C3. And then you take the GCD of n, so your, your large prime. Then you take, so let's call this uh, h, h minus, 
And then you do H minus this, I think. Uh, let me double check. Okay, sorry, the, the, these numbers, like these um, problems are super numeric. Ah, no, actually you, you, you take away this part. You take away essentially what this number is. So the, the um, like the expanded form of this. So let's call this star. So H minus star. This may or may not give you a, a primitive root. But if you see, it's a bunch of iteration. You're kind of randomly trying. And you might land on a root. So you might get p is equal to 1. But you might, get, you might actually get, you know, if p and q are close together, um, you might get p or q. And this, kind of, this is a pretty easy attack to break. Like, I mean, you can teach a five-year-old to do this. Um, just try a bunch of numbers on a calculator. And then, you know, like do it in, in not in five-year-old, but I guess like a grade five or two play around with powers and then break it if they do. Um, because you, all you need to do is compute the GCD. And as we saw, GCD is a very simple calculation. That's one. Then there's Pollard's P minus 1, which is, so this is, again, this is an attack when P or Q are close together. Now, there's another attack on RSA, when, not when P and Q are close together, but when P is what you call a B-smooth number. What is a B-smooth number? That means, sorry, like not P, but N, the composite number. So when n is b smooth, that means that it's prime factorization. So n, p, q, you know, r. So this is a1, a2. These are exponents. So when all of these, like no, none of the primes exceeds b. So all of the primes factorization, like all the prime factorization for n is less than or equal to b. This is what a b smooth number is. And usually, for example, you can have a very large prime b a 5 smooth number. So you're going to have your prime in terms of 2, 3, and 5. And it turns out that you have a method, uh, and this is Pollard's p minus 1, where if you actually, so if you pick one of these primes, so let's say let's, we set a is equal to 2, and then we do something really, really, I guess, deathly simple, which is we, we test essentially a to, we, we set it to some numberless minus, and I, and I believe it's, I think it's just minus 1 or minus L. Um, yeah, it is minus 1. Mod P. And we try to compute that. So, so we, we, we get this, like, we get some number, you know, call it H. And then we get the GCD of, if I remember, the result of this and your n. So you get your, so you get some h mod n, and then you take the gc, the, like the greatest common denominator of essentially this h and n, and n would be on the left, of course, it's, it's the largest one, but this can give you a factor of n. It'll give, it can, it can give you a factor of n. So you keep trying this, so you, first you get the h, and then you run the gcd, and if it's one, you keep trying. And you keep trying and trying, but it can happen that um, essentially what you do is that you, you don't run, you don't just increment this. You actually, you, you're trying to do factorial. So you do a, so for, your, for example, you do a one factorial, two factorial, sorry, a two factorial. But you know what? Factorials are really easy in modulo because essentially a, for example, you're getting two factorial. So from a one to a so a, from a1 factorial to a2 factorial is simply a1 to the power of 2, right? You power it. And it happens that you know, th these powers are always going to be in the realm of 1 to p, or sorry, 1 to n. So it's actually not, they're not very large numbers. Because once you take the, so first you take the modulo of this, and then you apply the power. So it's not going to be very large numbers. Um, and then there's always the fast powering algorithm. I skipped over it. But it's really easy. It's simply, if you want to compute, like let's say if I want to compute um, two, like 2 to the 200 modulo 50, or sorry, like not 2 to the 200, I guess prime uh, modulo 41, I think. So if I want to do 2 to the, two, two the 200, wow, I am killing your pens. 2 to the 200 modulo, I'm going to say P. This is really easy. Let's start with 2 times 2 gives us 4. You know, 
mod p. Eventually, we're going to overflow p, right? But then, so then this gives us 2 squared. And then we can do 2 squared times 2 squared. And this is always going to be in the, in the realm of p. So we can double. So we can double and add, double and add, double and add as it's convenient to us. And it happens that 2 to the 200, you know, we go, you know, we go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. Then we go to 256. And we already passed 200. Look, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, no, 5, 6, 7. In seven calculations, I already got to 128. And none of these numbers are bigger than p. Because let's say I said 2 to 2 is 4, then I just have to do 4 squared. And I can square each one. And then eventually it wraps around, of course, because it's a modulo. So powers, large powers in modulo are not a problem to compute. You can always use fast powering for this polar to p minus 1, where you are doing the a factorial. So it's really easy. Um, right? So we don't have to worry about it being factorial um, at all, because we have fast powering, and fast powering is easy. So because of that, then you can potentially break an integer that is b. So, and so now, when we're picking two primes, we can't have them close together. And we can't have the factor and having a factorization that is b smooth. So now we have problems. That means, like RSA is actually not that easy to to um, to what's it called? It's not that secure. It's not easy to protect yourself with, right? And there's even another problem. And like this is the one that you talked about. And you can actually take if you have. So this is the one I'm not. Uh, I was gonna make originally an exercise for it, but I didn't. If you have different ends, but you always have, let's say, e is equal to 3, or e is equal to some small exponent, you can take the Chinese remainder theorem of three, essentially, three, um, three ciphertexts encoded with a public key. You take the CRT, and you can solve for the plain text, the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, but we're, we're not going to do an application of it right now, because we're going to move on. Um, I was going to say factorizing RSA attack, but I showed you. So this is what I was going to do. So this was the pen and paper one. Uh, holy moly, how much do we have? Let's, let's blaze today. We have an hour. No, we can go a little. Okay, so digital signatures is, you know what? Easier for you to think about it is just think about it like Mac. Very similar to Mac. The only difference is that now it's asymmetrical. So sign takes it, and, and by the way, sign, this, this is non-invertible now. Like the main difference is sign is going to only take the private key, and it's going to give you a signature, which we denote as sigma. And verify is going to take that signature and your message and your public key, your asymmetric key. Remember, we, we talked about the RSA keys. We, so like something like this. Um, and we get essentially a Boolean of whether it was correct or not. Um, and there's more than one way of, con like, of constructing a signature. But if we follow the types, this is exactly how our signature works. So remember, we have a key pair. Now, like when, when we when we... I didn't go over gen because I've gone over gen 50 times, but this gen is a little bit different. Our gen is n now produces a private key and a secret, and a, what's it called, and a public key. So PK being like, what's it called, public key, SK, secret key. Or, or you could say priv k, pub k, doesn't matter. Um, but now our thing produces a key pair and a public key which we publish. Um, and by the way, when, when you do t like LSSL certificates, it's, I mean, it's a much more complicated standard than just digital signatures. But in general, the, the notion of having a public key and a, public, and a private key never protects you against, what's it called, man in the middle, if they want to just swap out your keys. And let's say... If they can control the... Yeah, so it, it, ne well, it never will protect you, on, like, if they can intercept and send it faster. Um, or they, if they can, you know... If, if they can just put themselves literally, that's what a man in the middle is. They're blocking this message and they're, so I, I could take your public key and then the attacker has a new public key and he sends his public key to the other person and then he can decrypt all the messages in transit. So in TLS actually, that's why we have certificate authorities. That's literally the way people went around it. Is this, we're saying these people are trustworthy. Like we publish our certificates to them. Let's encrypt, which I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of. That is a certificate authority. So Let's Encrypt says, I am, like, you guys trust me, right? So when you, you say you trust me, if I go to josecardona.ca, then you are going to trust me that that certificate that is on josecardona.ca is actually Jose's certificate, right? And that's how, that's, and what actually happens now that we have gone to, to RSA is that we can actually talk about how TLS does it. And when we talked about M1 and M2, 
What actually happens is that you negotiate. First, you negotiate a key exchange algorithm. So it can be Diffie-Hellman, or it can be elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. It could be ED2559. I think it's, those, it's being added to the TLS standard. Not yet, though. Um, yeah, they, they are considering switch to networkers. Yes?